All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That's where we're going to be today. If you have your Bible, you can open it, swipe to it, uh, whatever you need to do. If you don't have your Bible, our verses are going to be on the screen right here, and we'll, uh, we'll dive in there in just a second. So while you're turning there, let me ask you a question. Uh, how many of you are, when you go on vacation, maybe you like to go to the beach? How many beach people we got in here? Any, any beach people? All right, all right. How about uh, maybe mountains? Some of you guys are mountain. Well, okay, all right. Mountains people are, uh, are a little rowdy this morning. How about maybe um, the city? You'd like to go to a new city, explore new cities, new restaurants, city people in the place. You guys are a little more refined. I see that. Okay, um, that's cool. Uh, my family likes to, to do a little bit of all of those, but our favorite vacation spot is the beach. Um, we love to go to the beach um, if we can on spring break, if we can in the summer. So we, we go, we try to go every year. Um, a few years ago, we were at the beach, but it was raining. I mean, you hate it when you go on a beach vacation and you can't wait to be in the sun and then it rains the whole time. Um, this happened on our beach vacation. And so we decided to take a break from the condo, take a break from the indoor pool and go to the movies. So we load our family up in the SUV. We take off to the movies and we pull in the parking place and the parking plate, the, the car in the parking place in front of us had a license plate on it that honestly, when I saw it, it angered me. And uh, you may be surprised when I tell you what it was about that license plate that angered me. Um, here's what the license plate said. It said, we attend Buffalo Creek Baptist Church. And you hear that and you go, huh? Why are you angry about we attend Buffalo Creek Baptist Church? I don't have a vendetta against Buffalo Creek. I don't know their pastor. I have no idea where Buffalo Creek Baptist Church is, anything about that. But I saw that little um, license plate that said, we attend Buffalo Creek Baptist Church. And it angered me in that moment because of the two little words that said, we attend. It was we attend because as I sat there and I began to process like, man, we're, we're going to this movie theater, this thing that like is all about us consuming it and it making me happy. I thought about this little thing that said, we attend Buffalo Creek Baptist Church. And what I thought about is that's often the way we think about church, is it not? And so what we've been doing in this series is we've been saying, no, we're, the church is not something that we merely attend. No, we are the church. And so we've been looking at different New Testament concepts and what New Testament writers say about who we are as the church. And if you think about this whole movie theater illustration, I mean, think about what you, what you do when you go into a movie theater. You, you get there and everything at that theater is reverse engineered to make sure that you are happy and entertained, is it not? Right? Like the seats are comfortable and getting more and more comfortable in theaters. Now they have the like, you know, the, where you can order and they'll bring your food to your seat at the theater, right? And you, you walk in, um, you get your food, you go to your comfortable seat, you get the right seat next to the aisle just in case you need to slip out. And you got to be sure that you put a little space between you and the person next to you, right? You got to get that comfortable seat. Then uh, the movie comes on and you're enamored by watching what's happening in front of you. And the whole time that thing's happening, you're thinking about, do I like that particular person that I see in front of me on the screen in this case? Do I, do I like the musical scores of this movie? Do those characters make me laugh or make me cry or make me emotional or move me to do certain things? Do they improve my life in some way? Right, and then you leave the theater, you walk out, you throw your popcorn thing away or whatever it is, you walk out, and if you're like me, you're walking through the parking lot of the theater, talking to the person you came with, evaluating what you just saw in that room. It was good, I didn't like it, it was too long, it was too short, the air was too cold, it was too warm in there, right? We all do that, do we not? We often think about church also the way we think about attending a movie. So in that moment when I saw this thing that said, we attend Buffalo Creek Baptist Church, this is what's stirring in my heart. And what the Bible is going to say to us today as we um, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is that the church is not something to be consumed. In fact, he's going to say this. He's going to say, we are not consumers, we are contributors. We're not consumers, we're contributors. In 1 Corinthians, here's the context of 1 Corinthians. Uh, Paul 
wrote the book of 1 Corinthians. There were multiple letters to the Corinthian church. Um, He wrote 1 Corinthians about 10 years after he went there on his second missionary journey. Planted this church in this city that was like um, a hub of commerce and entertainment. Um, It was a port city. And so all of those things happened there. Lots of people, lots of fun, lots of exciting things in uh, the, the city of Corinth. The gospel goes there on Paul's second missionary journey. People respond, a church springs up. But now what's happening some decade, about a decade later, is Paul's noticing that some of that consumer mentality that was a part of the culture, because there were so many exciting things in Corinth, some of that consumer mentality is creeping its way into the church body. And rather than the church influencing the culture, um, the culture is influencing the church. And so there's all this sort of consumerism, consumer mentality um, going on inside the church at Corinth. And so what Paul does is Paul writes to them to address some of these issues. And he's going to say to them, in summary, we're not consumers, we're contributors. And what he's going to do along the way is going to sort of give them lots of thoughts, but I want to kind of summarize them in three concepts that the Apostle Paul gives to the church at Corinth to basically pastor them from a consumer mentality and into a contributor mentality, okay? And so we're going to start reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, and uh, here's what Paul says. He says, just as a body... Though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, whether slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now, let me summarize what he's just said in those two verses with this statement. He's saying, guys, we're all supernaturally connected. We're we're all supernaturally connected. Now, um, I already told you Corinth was a port city. People from all over came there. So it was kind of a melting pot of all kinds of of different cultures, different ethnicities. In fact, in these verses, Paul says Jews and Gentiles, slaves uh, and, and free, people of all shapes, sizes, socioeconomic classes, all those things were there in Corinth. But the problem with that is, In that day, all of those different distinctions created dividing lines between people. Um, That was a very significant issue in that day. If you were different than someone culturally, there were very clean dividing lines between you and the other person that was different than you culturally. I mean, there were social distinctions and political distinctions and ethnic distinctions and class distinctions and all kinds of different things that would divide people. And then what happens is... This church that sprung up in Corinth has all of these people who have responded to the gospel and wanted to live a new life in Christ, but have lived their entire lives being divided by those distinctives. And it had created this dividing line between them that now in the church has created factions. And what's interesting is each of those factions in the Corinthian church um, kind of thought, well, well, our faction's the best faction. And so we want things done our way. We want things tailored around the, this kind of culture and this kind of socioeconomic class or this kind of education level, or this kind of background. We want things done our way. So Paul writes to them to say, no, 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 no. This is a different kind of community than what you've been used to your entire life. There's something different that's happening here in the church. This is not just an event you attend and have it your way, like the old Burger King slogan from many years ago. This is not just an event you attend. This is a different kind of community. The Holy Spirit has supernaturally connected you together. Um, It's probably no secret to most of you, I attended Auburn University. And uh, somebody said, ooh, very lightly, and that's primarily because it's not been a good year for us on the football field. Um, But something happens at Auburn that's really unique and is a little weird, honestly. Um, After a football Saturday victory, which there have not been many of this year, um, something happens. The thousands of people in the stadium that are Auburn fans leave the stadium and walk about two blocks away to this little area uh, on campus called Tumor's Corner, and there are these giant oak trees there. So something happens there that's super weird, and uh, what they do is they bring with them toilet paper, and to celebrate a victory, they 
I'm not going to throw this in the crowd. I, I toyed with throwing this into the crowd. I'm not going to do that. Uh, to celebrate a victory, they throw toilet paper in the tumor's corner oak trees. And that's like a thing they do at Auburn to celebrate this victory that was won for them on the field by a bunch of 18 to 21-year-old kids. What's crazy about this is <clears throat> there's this one block and these trees and literally thousands of people from different parts of the state of Alabama, which is where Auburn is, and all around the southeast, from different education levels, some who attended Auburn and got advanced degrees, some who did not, they're just fans, uh, black, white, everything in between, um, some who are super successful, some who are not successful and had to scrape up their last pennies to buy the ticket to the game, and all of these people all together on one city block, hugging each other, loving each other, throwing toilet paper into the oak trees on Tumor's Corner to celebrate this victory in a game that they did not even play in. What Paul's saying is that much like that football game unites Auburn fans, there's something much greater that happens in the body of Christ. There's a greater victory that was won for us, a victory that we did not win, a victory that was not won by 18 to 21 year olds on a football field, a victory that was won by a savior on a cross who walked out of the grave and defeated death for us. And Jesus, what Paul is saying is, because then when we receive him by faith, he places his Holy Spirit inside of us, then what happens is there's something about the Holy Spirit being in us that unites us. In spite of our differences, all of these people who are all different types of people from all over the globe and different socioeconomic classes and political party affiliations and all kinds of things all come together and there's this incredible supernatural thing that happens that he connects us together. In fact, it's not just within the walls of this building or in our Columbia location. It literally happens all around the world. I remember about 12 years ago, I was in West Africa at a, uh, uh, with some missionaries that were friends of ours and uh, they were planting a church there. And so Vanessa and I and a few other people went to hang out with them and encourage them for the week. And they took us out to this um, village in the bush in Africa that they were ministering to. And they had shared the gospel in this village and there was only one person in the village that had ever come to Christ. And, and when I say remote, man, there was no electricity, no running water. We were miles from any of that stuff. Mud, uh, you know, huts, thatch roofs, cooked their food on open flames, you know, in a, with a, like a campfire kind of thing. Like it was very, very remote. The people in this village could not be more different than us. And I remember we walked into this village and this guy comes running, literally running from a hut back in the back of the village. He comes out and our missionary friend says, that's the guy. We're like, what, what are you talking about? What's the guy? And he said, that's the guy that when we shared the gospel, he came to Christ. And he comes up to us and he starts rattling something off in the Maninka language. I have no idea what he said, but there was something incredible about that moment that I'm telling you, I can't even explain it. There was something about his spirit connecting to our spirits in that moment that we just felt like, man, I don't even, you know, you, you're so, you couldn't be more different than me, but somehow we're family. I, I don't know how to explain that. I don't know, you know, why, why we felt that way, except for the fact that what Paul's saying here is true, that, that the Holy Spirit supernaturally binds our hearts together and connects us with, with the body of Christ, and, and so if you look around this room, what you'll see here and in Colombia, you'll see people who are rich and poor. You'll see people who are young and old. You'll see people who are highly educated and people who have very little education. You'll see Republicans and Democrats. And, and listen, hardcore Republicans and Democrats. You'll see black and white and everything in between. You'll see Alabama Crimson Tide fans and Christians. All in... <laughs> You like that? You like that? <laughs> stop, stop. <laughs> wow, great, I didn't expect that. All right, uh, you'll see people that should hate each other all together in one place, locking arms for the same cause. Why? Because what Paul's saying is we're supernaturally connected to each other. 
And the things that should divide us and make us selfish and make us want it our way and make us more into a consumer mentality because of the Holy Spirit in us, those things shouldn't be that way because we're supernaturally connected. And, and so Paul uses this like as the foundation to build the rest of his encouragement to the Corinthians on. He says we're, we're supernaturally connected, but not only that, number two, we need each other. We, we need each other. Um, one theologian says there was something happening in the Corinthian church called, sup, uh, called, um, called uh, rugged individualism. Rugged individualism. They were allowing those dividing lines to divide them and them want, want it the way they individually wanted it. And what Paul's about to say is, no, 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 you can't let that happen. We need each other. Verse 14, look, even so the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong in the body, it would not be for that reason, uh, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, I love this line, God has placed, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The I can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In the first part of verse 22, on the contrary, we, we can't, we don't get to say because we're one way that we don't need another person that's another way. We don't get to say, Paul saying that we don't need each other. Why? Because we're all part of the body and the different parts of the body need each other. Um, you may not geek out over this. I do. I think this is kind of cool. Like science things fascinate me. And I read this this week. Did you know that your body consists of 200 bones linked by 900 ligaments and 4,000 tendons? That your heart pumps uh, through blood vessels, your blood, which if you were to, to stretch out all of your blood vessels like all out together like this, they would be enough, each of, each of us, to stretch around the world, the entire world, three times. That's how many blood vessels you have in your body. The palms of your hands have tens of thousands of touch receptors. There are about 30 trillion cells in your body, and each one of them is densely coated with something called DNA that gives instructions for how those cells should operate. And all of that is controlled by the brain in which synapses fire and there are about 100 billion neurons traveling at 250 miles per hour inside your body every moment of the day your entire life. And what Paul's saying is the church is a lot like that. That when the body is healthy, that the, the, when all of those things work together the way they're supposed to, the body is healthy. Well, in fact, what the psalmist said is, that uh, we were knit together in our mother's womb. He also said we we're fearfully and wonderfully made. That God had a design in the human body and the way he created it and all of its complexity that when it works together, it flourishes and it's healthy and it's awesome. But when a couple of those parts of the body, when those synapses don't fire the right way, the body's not healthy. When those touch receptors don't work the way they're supposed to, the body is not healthy. Right, when those things, that when our heart doesn't plump, pump the blood through our vessels the way it should, our body is not healthy. And what Paul's saying is the church is exactly the same way. That the church, it's not an organization. It's an organism. And here's the distinction. An organization has org charts and um, profit and loss statements, right? And, um, and checks and balances, and, and you know, any good organization has to have all of those things. But what Paul's saying is, no, no, the church is not merely a conglomeration of things like that. The church is not an organization. The church is much more, it's an organism, a living organism. And when one part works the way it's supposed to, and the other part works the way it's supposed to, and that part, and this part, and all the parts work the way they're supposed to, the body flourishes. But when they don't, the church is unhealthy. We need each other, is what he's saying. I've never known um, this to be more true than about three years ago. 
I remember where I was. I was actually um, on staff at the bridge during that season, and I was sitting in my office upstairs here at our Spring Hill location when I got a phone call, and it was my wife, Vanessa. And she said, I uh, just went to the doctor, and I knew she was going that day, routine checkup. Just went to the doctor. The doctor thinks I have cancer. And I remember going like, I mean, it's just a normal day, you know, it's just a routine checkup. We're kind of young, you know, it's no big deal. Doctor thinks I have cancer and just going, huh? What? Floored, terrified, blown away. Somebody worked on our team at that time named Julie and uh, Julie and Scott are part of our church. And Julie heard me on the conversation. She comes in, she knocks, she says, hey, I don't mean to like bother you, but I just heard some of that conversation. Are, are you okay? And so I, I, in my office, just burst into tears and I'm telling Julie, you know, we, we think Vanessa has cancer. We'll know later today, more tests, whatever it is. Um, and so Julie, just pray. So I kind of finished a couple things. And then when Vanessa got home, I, I, I went home immediately. <clears throat> and that afternoon was so hard, y'all. If you've ever been in a situation like that, you know, like it, it, was, it was really hard. Um, terrified. We get word that it is cancer. So Julie calls back later that afternoon. She calls me. She says, hey, just want to circle back. I want you to know I've been praying for you all day. Uh, what happened? Did, how's Vanessa? She has cancer. And Julie said, I'll be there in a few minutes. <laughs> well, about 15, 20 minutes later, Julie knocks on the door and she said, surprise, it's not just me. She brought Scott, her husband, with her. And she brought Kathy with her. Kathy is somebody in her church. It was at our Columbia location at the time that um, had had the same kind of cancer Vanessa had. Kathy shows up at my front door. Kimberly and Mark Johnson, uh, who are part of our Spring Hill location, show up. at my. They're all together with Ju Julie brought all of these people. I see them and I burst immediately into tears. And they're hugging us. We're all crying on my front steps. My neighbors are going, what the heck's going on at the Dalberry's house? You know, we come inside and uh, I'll never forget this. Kimberly grabs me by the shoulders like this. And she looked at me. And if you know Kimberly, she's got a great, big, beautiful smile. She said, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And I'm weeping. We're all weeping, crying. They sat down and just encouraged us for about an hour. I'm calling, you know, some of the guys that are, that are elders and, and I'm saying, hey, I, we think Vanessa has cancer. They're praying. They're sending me texts. What happened over the next several weeks is that whole cancer thing unfolded in our lives. Vanessa's cancer free now and it's awesome. But during that season was we, we saw just something incredible happen in the body of Christ. Like people with the gift of prayer prayed. People with the gift of, you know, baking and providing, you know, uh, food brought food for us literally for weeks, for weeks. People with the gift of hospitality would welcome us at the front door right out here at our Columbia, our Spring Hill location with smiles. And they put their hand on my shoulder and they'd say, and Vanessa's shoulder, and they'd say, how are you doing? How's Vanessa doing? Right, people in kids ministry who are gifted to serve the next generation, loved all my kids, came and picked them up, took them to, to get pizza, encouraged them. People who had compassion gifts came and sat with me at hospitals when Vanessa was in surgery stayed and cared for us after, brought gifts for us, things that would help us in this journey of cancer. Like it was just incredible. You guys, this was the body of Christ being the body of Christ. This is not something we attend. This was the body of Christ being the body of Christ. And I got to tell you, I love the Bible. What I didn't need in that moment was another Bible study. Right? I, I'm, a, I love, I'm, a, I'm an elder. I love strategic initiatives. I didn't need another strategic initiative in that moment. I needed the church to be the church. And did she ever show up in a big way? And listen, let me tell you something. If you're new here and you're trying to figure out, is this the church for me? This is a church in which people don't just attend. This is a church where we are the church and you'll be loved. And, and uh, come, hey, come on, more than one of you need to clap for that. That's right. <laughs> And Paul's saying, we don't get to say to another part of the body, I don't need you. We need each other. And if you've not experienced a moment like my family experienced, you will. And, and for those of you who that's not you in that moment, that person needs you. And you will need them at some point. We are the church. We're supernaturally knit together and we need each other. Because the church is not an organization. The church is much more. 
It's an organism. But, but not only that, what Paul's about to tell us is, is something that's incredible. And you see it in verse 27. Look what he says. Verse 27, he says, Now you are the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. And each one of you has a part in it. Each one of you is a part of it. Each one of you. What Paul's saying to us is the third thing, is that we all have a role. We all have a role in the body of Christ. In fact, um, look at verse 22. It kind of unpacks it. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unrepresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body. I love that line. God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now, what Paul's just done, really starting in verse 21 that I didn't read just now, all through those, is he's divided uh, the church body into two sort of categories of giftings. He talks about in verse 21, the head, the hands, the feet, the eyes. He's talking about external types of gifting. Things that are external, that are forward-facing, like preaching the word like this, like teaching the word, like leading worship, things that are forward-facing. And then he talks about things that are not as much external, but that are internal and not seen as publicly. Does it in verse 22, things, like, things that, are, um, that, that are more hidden. He says in this passage that kind of require more modesty. And he's talking about things like the heart and lungs and things, parts of our bodies that you don't see, but that are vitally important to the health of our bodies. And his point is when all of the, that we need all of those. And when they all work together, it's this beautiful picture of health. And the, when the church body, body, body flourishes, the community is impacted in a big way. Um, what I love about this passage, and then back in verse 18, you get this idea of the fact that God has designed it to be this way. That he's sovereignly organized it all to be this way. Um, there's this awesome verse in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. It says, we're, in verse 10, it says, we're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Why? For the purpose of good works, the Bible says, that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The word workmanship is the word poema. It's, it's the word we get our word poem from. It could also mean masterpiece. And the idea is God has painstakingly created you exactly the way you are. Like he's, he's drawn every piece of you exactly the way he wants you to be. Your temperament, your personality type, your experiences, things that you're passionate about. He's made you exactly the way you are. We're God's poema created in Christ Jesus. Why? For the purpose of good works. In other words, so that we'd not just be consumers, but that we'd use that poema to be contributors. And then in Ephesians 2.10, it says that God prepared when? Beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, a long time ago, God had an awesome idea that he would create you exactly the way you are so that you would use all of that giftedness, he would, that you would use your poema in good works that he prepared all the way back then before he ever even made you, that you would walk in those gifts and you would use them to contribute, not to just consume you see, the idea that Paul's describing here, and I think the reason he says here in 1 Corinthians that God made it this way, God designed it, God so organized the body, I think what he's saying is that you may have thought you came to the Bridge Church because you liked Pastor Ian's preaching. You may have thought that you came to the Bridge Church because Bridge Worship is incredible. You may have thought you came because student ministry impacted your kids and kids ministry impacted your, your, your younger kids. You may have thought, Columbia, that you came and wanted to be a part of this church because the first thing you saw was Pastor Freddie's smiling face on the patio at Columbia Central High School. But actually, those consumeristic reasons that you might have thought you came to this church are not actually the reason you came to this church. That God, long before he ever even made you, had an idea that he would put you together in your poema -ness. Because he was making an organ that this body needed to flourish. 
we're supernaturally woven together, right? We need each other, but you have a role in it. You have a part in it. Uh, there's this amazing story in Acts chapter nine of this lady named Tabitha. Um, her, is, there's a Greek and a Hebrew translation of her name. One is Tabitha, the other is Dorcas. And that's weird, so I prefer Tabitha. We'll call her Tabitha. <clears throat> <laughs> and uh, there's this awesome story. She was a, a, a businesswoman um, who was known for making and selling fine linens. In fact, it's how she made her fortune. And so the church sprung up in this city called Joppa. And, uh, and man, God was just doing incredible things. People were coming. It was awesome. They ran out of space. So they start using Tabitha's, Dorcas's house for the church in Joppa that needed extra space. She said, sure, take my house. She was once someone who made a ton of money selling fabric. She actually became known in the church body and in the city of Joppa for someone who said, you know what? The Lord's given me that gift. I want to give those fabrics away now to people. She was known for giving them away now to people who had a need. See, Tabitha was incredible. She's not a pastor. Her gifts aren't external. She's not going to stand up and say, open your Bibles to chapter five of whatever. She's not going to lead worship. But she was using her poema because she knew that she had a part in the body that would make the body healthier. And it flourished in the city of Joppa and God did incredible things because they all needed each other. And they all had a part and they all worked together. And I love that story. What it says actually in verse um, 37 of uh, Acts chapter nine, it says that Tabitha was someone who was always, quote, always known for doing good and serving others always known for doing good and serving others. And I read that and I go, could people say that about me? <laughs> Chris is always known for doing good and serving others. Whew. I don't think so. What's amazing though, is you, I think about Tabitha and I think about people who are known for doing good and serving others. And I think about so many other people right here in our church. We've got our own Tabitha stories all around us. I was thinking about it this week and I thought about my friend Loretta. 99% of you don't know Loretta, but she serves in the baby room here in Spring Hill. She's retired, has been for many years, took care of her family. They're all adults. She has grand, grandkids now. But now she takes care of your family and she holds those babies in there. And while she holds those babies, she's not just holding a baby because you have to volunteer. So that's what she's doing. No, she's holding those babies and she's praying over them. And she said, God, would you use this child as a warrior for the kingdom to take the gospel to places the gospel's never been, to be a light in a dark world? God, would you, would you use this baby singing worship songs over the baby, serving you, mom and dad, because this might be the only reprieve you've gotten from crying babies all week long. So she's serving you so that you can come and be refreshed by the gospel, by worshiping together with a church body, by having your faith lifted by the body of Christ around you. And we've got our own Tabitha stories like Loretta. We, we've got stories of people like Daniel Brady, who's at our Columbia location, who literally for the last four and a half years of the existence of our Columbia location, every Sunday, every Sunday, arrives early to set up and tear down, set up and tear down, set up and tear down, to transform Columbia Central High School from a high school to a church building so that people can come there to get to know Jesus, to become like him for the sake of the world. See, Daniel Brady, he's not going to stand on the stage and lead worship or preach a sermon. It's more of an internal gift, but no less important than anything Pastor Ian or anybody who would stand on this stage would do. See, we've got our own Tabitha stories like Daniel. Most of you know Veronica Rossman. Veronica was at our eight o'clock service in Spring Hill this morning. She sat right there. She's often in the 930 service here. And, and she, she's not going to be on the stage. She's not going to sing songs. But you know what she thinks her gift is? Amen. <laughs> That's it. You got it. You got it. She, she's going to shout. She's going to clap. She's going to encourage whoever's up here preaching the word because she knows when this person's encouraged, you're encouraged right? And it may be only Veronica, but she's using her poema to make the body of Christ healthy. By the way, we need more Veronica's in this place. Do we not? Come on. We need, we need more. That's right. She and I had this thing where I've said many times, Veronica, can you just follow, Veronica, can you follow me around and just say, come on. 
preach it. Won't he do it? Won't he? Just follow me around all the time. <clears throat> See, we've got our own Tabitha stories and so many more. Here's what I want to ask you. Those people, they'd recognize they're not just consumers, they're contributors. How about you? How about you? Are you just coming in, consuming, evaluating what you see in front of you, that was good or not? Or are you a contributor? Let me say it a different way. What Paul said in this passage, you were not created just to sit and soak. <laughs> you were created to serve. God made you to serve. Don't just sit and soak. Serve. Serve. This body needs you. You were designed to be here. This body was designed with a gap that you can fill and you alone can fill. So don't just sit and soak. Serve. Maybe you're here and, uh, and you go, man, I, bro, I'm just here because my marriage is busted up. I, I don't have anything to give right now. Cool. We need each other. Let this body serve you for a little while. And then when you're ready, serve. Maybe you're here and you go, look, I, 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 just, I just came, you know, because I, I need hope in my life. There are people here who want to serve you by helping you find the hope that you're looking for. So thank you for being here. We're so, welcome home. We're so glad you're here and we want to help you in your journey, okay? Let's not just be consumers. Let's be contributors and see what the Lord does in and through this body called the Bridge Church for his glory and for the sake of the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for um, God, uh, for giving us Jesus who transforms our lives. God, for... Um, for giving us hope in you, but hope that we don't just keep to ourselves, hope that we, because we've been served, we serve. That we, that we share with others, that we give to others. God, would, would, you, would you use this church body to do something beyond what we can ever ask or imagine? God, we give all the glory. To you. This is, this is, we don't serve because we get something from it. We serve because you've give some, given something to us. And so God, would you uh, forgive us when we steal glory from you? And would you uh, allow us the grace to always, always give the glory for you, to you, for everything you give us. And we do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us on our YouTube channel today. I hope that you felt the welcome home of Christ right through your screen. Here we believe that the gospel is good news worth sharing. So if you'd like to share this stream with your friends and family, you can also subscribe to this channel and you can use at Bridge Church TN. Also, if you'd like to give, there's a link in the description there. You can click and it'll walk you through all the steps. And if you'd like to stay connected with us, you can simply head on over to bridge.tv. Hope to see you again soon.